good. Okay. This is um, a, a, a study, um, a talk that's based upon recent research that I've done on the history of the black country in the last few years. And some of the results of that appeared in a book that came out just before Christmas, The Black Country, A History in a Hundred Objects, which I co-edited with uh, David Everly, who some of you might know, uh, he's written a lot about uh, household objects, used to be a curator at the Black Country Museum, and Janet Sullivan, who is a former PhD student of mine. The book was a challenging one because there's so little to go on when it comes to the history of the black country in terms of substantial, serious and interesting pieces of work. There are some, there's a lot hidden away in journals, um, but not a great deal that's easily accessible to the public. There's a lot of picture books. Um, I'm not disparaging those, but of course, picture books are just that. They don't give a narrative, they don't offer explanations, they illustrate. Um, and this was an attempt in this book to provide an accessible history of the black country, which was also serious and based upon um, research and, and, and appropriate information. So in essence, the three of us spent a long, long time trying to select what those hundred objects would be. We, we had help from a lot of people in the black country who were extremely supportive. And we got a number of those individuals to write substantial articles about these objects. I wrote a number and so did David and Janet. And we provided an extensive set of appendices. So there's a lot there. And I, I did an introduction, which I must say rather modestly, I'm proud, proud of because it was an attempt to distill um, a lot and to, in, in, uh, in about eight to 10,000 words and to try and make sense of an area of the country that is frequently overlooked um, and frequently disparaged and frequently ignored. People might whiz through it on the M5 and M6 as Queen Victoria used to whiz through on, on her train and a, allegedly draw the curtains when she got to Tipton. But that's a, another story. Um, it is an area of the, the country that's attracted the interest of artists and writers and poets. And on the front of the book, um, you can see an image which may well be familiar to a number of you. It's a, a painting by J.M.W. Turner, watercolour by J.M.W. Turner of Dudley, uh, with Dudley Castle you can see at the top. I might say more about that image later because it comes into my, um, my talk itself. What do we mean by the black country? Well that's easier said than done. Um, in terms of the contemporary black country, we essentially have the four boroughs of Walsall, top right hand side, Wolverhampton, the left hand side, Dudley, bottom left hand side, and Sandwell on the bottom right hand side, which is the part of the black country in which I, I, I currently live. Um, we tend to use this as a label these days, uh, the black country society, sees itself as a society for these four boroughs. The Black Country Living Museum uh, collects items from these four areas. But as you'll see, as I go through the talk today, it's not easy to know exactly what the Black Country might be. And it causes a lot of problems when you give a definition to someone, particularly within the Black Country. I'm going to try and pick up uh, six themes today. I'm going to first of all look at a number of images that provide ways of looking at the black country. I'm then going to try and offer some definitions of what we might mean by the black country um, and I've offered how we see it today but that's not how everybody sees it or how people have always seen it. I'm going to look at the origins 
I'm going to look at how the black country was invented historically, and then how the black country evolved economically and socially. And then I'll finish by looking at what I've loosely called transformations. In, in essence, what's been happening in recent years. Um, the main focus though of, of my talk is on the 18th and 19th century as, as the title suggests. Images first of all. Well, I'm beginning with an object which is colloquially known as the Dudley bug. And it's seen as a, one of the symbols of the black country, at least one of the symbols of Dudley. It's a trilobite, a fossil, which dates from millions and millions of years ago, when the whole area of the black country was sea. And when people got interested in the geology of the black country in the 19th century, they discovered these fossils and they became uh, an object which people could sell, have in their homes, stick in museums. There are a lot of these around. I, I'm, I'm sure you can buy trilobites on eBay, but I must admit I've never tried. Those of you who've been to Dudley Museum will see some, but also more particularly um, at the Lapworth Museum at the University of Birmingham, there's a lot there. Um, and that's a symbol of the age of the black country, how you can, you can begin by looking at it prehistorically uh, to, to, to go back to antediluvian times, so to speak. To race through, another symbol of the black country is the nail. Um, the black country for much of the 18th and 19th century was the world's leading manufacturer of, of nails, nails that were made by hand. And there you can see a selection of a wide range of nails. Uh, it's a very sort of specialist trade. You could have nails for horses hooves, uh, nails that were used for cabinet making, uh, nails in hobnail boots, um, etc, uh, etc. Et a whole series of variety of nails. Um, don't ask me to sort of name the different kind, but they've all got names. A, a student of mine uh, did a PhD on, on the nail industry, mainly focusing upon the cut nail trade, which basically killed off the hand na nail trade. But often in images of the black country for the 19th century, you will see a nailer hammering away um, in his or indeed her um, shed at the back of their houses, workshop at the back of their houses. Very much a uh, cottage-based industry until it was replaced by, by factory-made nails from, from Birmingham. Um, I've included this image because it actually refers to something that's easily overlooked when we come to the history of the black country. This is a, an image of Antigua in the Caribbean. A huge quantity of, of nails were exported really to all parts of the world, but particularly in, in Britain's colonies in Africa, the Caribbean, and in North America nails were widely exported. There's an image of this in the, the book, which has been annotated by um, Guy Shogren, the, the student I was talking about earlier. And he annotates the different types of nails that would be used in this image. There'd be nails used in the uh, plantation at the top of the hill, there'd be nails used in the boats, there'd be nails used in the barrels, um, there'd be nails used in building the hut and nails for the horses, hooves, etc. Um, it was a massive industry that underpinned the British economy to a very great extent. I hesitate to say that the nail industry and its exports around the globe underpinned the Industrial Revolution, but very much um, it uh, was a supportive element in the Industrial Revolution. And that's an important thing to note. The black country, ever since it became an industrial area, 
was a global region. It had connections with various parts of the world, not only in nail making, but in a whole series of other manufactured products, um, which I will can talk about later, the most obvious being chains. Another image. This is an image of the Crystal Palace, the interior of the Crystal Palace of 1851, the great exhibition of that year. And one of the centerpieces of the great exhibition was the um, the lens, uh, the, the lighthouse lens that was manufactured by Chance's Glass, which you can see right in the center of, of the, the, the picture. And this was a sort of striking piece of engineering um, made by Chance's Glass in Smethwick, which became uh, certainly the, the largest glass company in Britain in the 19th century. And it's a work of beauty. And of course, when we talk about lighthouses, we're talking about structures that were responsible for saving lives around the world. And a number of these chance lighthouses still survive. Um, sailors don't rely upon lighthouses anymore since they use satellite-based navigation systems, but they still exist. And I was amazed when I went to South Africa a few years ago to see one of these chance constructed lighthouses, not using the actual light, but it still had the pieces of the lighthouse ready to, to, to clean and reassemble for a museum that was being created there. Um, so the Crystal Palace became a showpiece for glass, for black country products not only in terms of what was inside, like that chance's glass, but also the building, the, the iron structure, the cast iron structure, and the glass were built, were constructed in the black country, um, the iron in Dudley and the glass panes by, once again, chance's glass. So that's another symbol of the black country and its industrial might. <coughs> we come to chains. Um, again, as with nail making, chains appear in the in images about the black country and often images of individuals, frequently women, hammering away at manufacturing nails. These are heavy duty nails, but nails could be much, uh, sorry, these are heavy duty chains, but chains could be much smaller, of course. There could be dog chains, um, that, 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 that could be uh, all kinds of change which are decorative for holding up lights, as well as huge ones that were used for the ocean going ships and the dreadnoughts of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And one final image this is a replica of the anchor of the Titanic, uh, another, to use an overworked word, iconic. Um, creation of the uh, black country made in Neverton. This replica is in the center of Neverton and if you drive through that town in the black country you will see that that structure. Of course the, the, the actual uh, anchor is at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, so those are images which are, are attempts to draw attention to ways in which we can legitimately see the black country. They're not the only ways in which we can see the black country, but the focus is very much on geology, its age, and the objects that were manufactured there. I'll come on to another image, and this is the black country flag, which those of you who follow the news will no, it's an item of considerable controversy. Um, it was a flag that became widely used from uh, 2012 onwards. Um, I'll explain the origins and then we can come on to some notions about it. There was a deliberate attempt to create a collective identity 
to the black country by having a flag. And there's nothing better than a flag to provide a collective identity as opposed to the, the, the coats of arms of the individual four black country boroughs or even drilling down further to the, the, the flags of individual towns like Rowley Regis or Stourbridge or Blockswich and, and, and so on. Um, I, I'm going to have, there's a little bit of text which helps to explain this. I, I put this on because I know this uh, PowerPoint is going to be put on, um, on, on, on the Erasmus Darwin House website. So I thought that would provide you with some text to look at. But it, the flag came about as a result of a competition that was held at the time of the Queen's Diamond Jubilee and to produce something before the London Olympic Games of 2012. The date 2012 was also really important for the history of the black country as it marked the 300th anniversary of the construction of Newcomen's atmospheric steam engine, the first one that was used uh, in the area and you can see a replica of course of that at the black at the black country living museum so the um the 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 image was produced to try and give some kind of collective identity a competition was held it was won by a local 12 year old student who was inspired by elihu burrett's famous phrase of the black country as black by day and red by night and she wrote in her entry this was because the local furnaces gave out smoke and grime during the day and glowed at night that is why my flag background is both black and red with the chain showing a typical product manufactured in the area the white symbol in the middle represents the glass cone which we have had since 1790 representing our glass making heritage I'll just go back to the image and you can see you've got uh, four colors black and red um, black by day red by night you've got a shape for the glass cone in the middle and you've got the chains one of the symbols of the industry of the industry in the area very very striking image however it's not an image that has attracted um, um, total support. Um, it is widely used if you drive around the black country or even elsewhere you will see people with a flagpole with the flag in their um, gardens. Um, people wear a badge, they display it in car windows. It's, it's used very much by a whole range of local organisations. It is an attempt to get beyond the insular identity of individual black country towns or streets um, and it is there to represent a uh, collective identity however <coughs> there are problems first of all given that there are four black country boroughs you can argue that the flag doesn't have to actually represent two of them uh, dudley and sandwell um, are the ones that are represented with connections to chain making and glass making but the flag doesn't have any particular connotations for the two other boroughs of Walsall and Wolverhampton um, their their industries were based upon other products so you can argue that the flag is not fully illustrative of all four the chain as well and this is an unfortunate byproduct and not intentional draws attention to a product chains that were sold to enslaved black people in the past and it's that that has led to a lot of objections from from people that the the flag is uncomfortable for for many individuals i don't want to get into the moral debate about this but i know individuals who find it a very, very uncomfortable um, image that is represented. You might also say that the colours inadvertently, and this totally unintentionally, are colours that are associated with, with fascism. If you look at the, 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 the fascist flags of the 1920s, red, um, 
black uh, and, and, and white was sort of heavily, heavily used. Um, but the, the, the whole controversy, I thought, is a very, very interesting one in that it shows that although people might attempt to give the black country an, a collective identity, they never succeed completely. And that's something that has historical roots. If you're interested in the controversies, I put on the link there, uh, a link to a, a, an Express and Star article online, which actually goes through uh, the different ways up to the present in which the flag has been controversial. Some of you may have seen that um, uh, the, 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 the fire brigade uh, authority in, in, in the black country uh, stopped a few weeks ago flying the flag and that led to uh, a lot of controversy in the press with many local MPs saying this is totally ridiculous but the controversy is there it will not go away and in fact it reflects something that is deep-rooted uh, about the region. If we can move forward to definitions I'm going to uh, deal with four things. I'm going to take a sort of comment by the historian Chris Upton, first of all. Chris Upton um, died recently, well, died in 2015 um, prematurely, born in Wolverhampton. He wrote a history of Wolverhampton, wrote a history of Litchfield, which many of you will be aware of. I want to say something that he, he said. And then I want to take three types of definitions. Um, of the black country that people have used over the centuries to try and define it. And you can see how difficult it is to, to reach any kind of agreement, even if we wanted to reach an agreement. Chris Upton, there's him, him smiling. And in one of his articles in the, uh, in, in the Birmingham Mail, he wrote once, the e no, it's, sorry, the Express and Star, he, he wrote, the easiest way to start a fight in a black country pub is to ask for a definition of the term. What do you mean by the black country? Um, well, I'm going to try and look at different definitions, but I don't want you to feel that I'm sort of plumping for any one of them. I'm just saying that the complexity of the area, and it's a rich diverse region has, 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 has led to a sort of complex way of trying to make sense of it. First of all, there's, if you like, the scientific definition, which you find most history books use, I, I, in, in my opinion, rather narrowly, but it makes a lot of sense. Um, and that's based on geology, topography, landscape and, and, and industry. It's used to refer to a specific industrial area of South Staffordshire and North East Worcestershire, not, in other words, the four black country boroughs, but only part of them, um, essentially largely parts of Sandwell and parts of Dudley, based on the so-called 10 yards coal seam, this enormous seam of coal that underpinned the black country economy for 200 odd years it's still there. Um, it could still be mined, but we don't use coal anymore. And uh, good people in the black country wouldn't want their houses demolished for that purpose. But of course, the 10 yard coal seam is associated with other minerals, particularly iron and limestone. And if we stretch out from the seam, clay, uh, a product that's frequently overlooked but an essential mineral of the black country which we need to bear in mind as being part of its uh, its it, its origins um, and these products underpinned industries such as iron smelting nail and chain making and indeed coal gas production so that's one definition and during the 19th century some beautifully artistically exquisite maps of the geology of the black country were produced. You won't make, be able to make out any details there. Uh, we've got a couple in the book. Um, 
and if you go online you'll you'll you'll, you'll find a number but th they're they're absolutely fantastic and and you can pour over them and get the details of the the the, the geology um the the dark area there is the area of the of, of, of coal mining um there's a another set of definition which in, in in a sense is a moral definition a negative definition dating from the 19th and 20th centuries um which coincided or if you like i would say preceded the the, the scientific geological definition of the black country and you can look at uh, writings you can look at images of the region and you get this tartarian picture provided of the black country in, in in images and in text this is a famous example uh, an image of the land near wolverhampton um, in 1866 um, it presented in the illustrated london news and there you can see a sort of sea of 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 factory chimneys or 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 chimneys of uh, of, of of workshops and foundries um, producing a huge amount of smoke and in the foreground there's an image of desolation worn out pits um, a desecrated landscape some people have argued that uh, J.R.R. Tolkien's uh, image um, of, of, uh, of Sauron in the of, uh, in, in, and, and the landscape of the black country, the, 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 the desolated landscape of the black country, Lord of the Rings, came from his visits to the black country. And during his boyhood, he lived in Birmingham. I don't want to comment about that, but there was a, an exhibition in, in, in Wolverhampton about Tolkien and the black country um, a few years ago. Um, to use an example of, 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 of text, um, they start really in the 1830s, these negative descriptions. One of the most sort of um, uh, bitter descriptions is in a book by Samuel Sidney, it's called Rides on Railways, which was designed really for the, the, the middle classes who spent a lot of time going on railways and they would get descriptions of the areas uh, they, they, they rode through. His description is as follows. The pleasant green of pastures is almost unknown. The streams in which no fishes swim are black and unwholesome. The natural dead flat is often broken by huge hills of cinders and spoil from the mines the few trees are stunted and blasted no birds are to be seen except a few smoky sparrows and for miles on miles a black way spreads around where furnaces continually smoke steam engines thud and hiss and long chains clank while blind gin horses engine horses walk their doleful round and then he makes a comment about people. The majority of the natives, an interesting description, are in full keeping with the scenery, savages without the grace of savages, coarsely clad in filthy garments with no change on weekdays and Sundays. They converse in a language belarded with fearful and disgusting oaths, which can scarcely be recognized are the same as that of civilized England. That is perhaps the most vitriolic of the descriptions of people of the black country and the landscape I've come across, but it's one of dozens, if not hundreds, that appear in newspapers, uh, books, um, uh, novels, etc. And then there's a third image. Um, which is a much more positive image, which is more recent. It's essentially come from uh, the 20th and 21st century, though you can see um, 19th century roots of this, where certainly the people in the black country, one can say, and it primarily comes from them, began to emphasize the qualities of the area they lived in 
and the qualities of the people. And these included very strong traditions of mutual aid through churches, chapels, friendly societies. In fact, if you like, of the culture of the street. One thing I noticed moving to the black country in the late 1980s is how close, if you like, the communities were compared to where I lived before. And when I started to work in Birmingham, how different the culture of Birmingham was from the black country. It's, uh, it's interesting, this sort of closeness. Um, so that was stress, the sort of mutual support side of, of things. Secondly, the emphasis on the skills and achievements of people there is revealed in the great exhibition of their international affairs, but more specifically in the huge, and the, the number is huge, range of products, whether we're talking about items such as the humble nail, which still has to be made, but also complex pieces of engineering. Um, the skills are there, and the skills of men and the skills of women. The distinctiveness of dialect and humour. The black country di dialect is often made fun of, but it's, it's celebrated, and there's a distinct humour, sort of self-deprecating humour, which I'm really now, after th over 30 years living in the area, I'm only getting a, a, a real sense of and, and, and entering. And then one can say more recently how the black country is being transformed, the greening of the black country. And as many of you will know very, very recently, the uh, large chunk of the black country has been designated as a UNESCO site of special interest. And that's going to be a, an enormous way of uh, giving the black country a, 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 a status, an international um, perspective which is positive based upon its its mining industrial and, and and cultural history so there's those three definitions which exhibit i would suggest complex ways of of looking at the area but those are ways in which people have labeled it but where does the black country come from well um the term is first used in the uh, 1830s or 1840s, depending upon which source you use. But there's, there's a prehistory to the black country. Um, as we understand it, an area with uh, an identity based upon mining, industry, skills, um, and increasingly uh, in the 18th century, a canal system which helped to tie it together. The, the prehistory, I would say, well, it goes back almost as long as you wish uh, to, to, to the early history of mining and industry. It's people like Dud Dudley who developed uh, a way, so it seems, of smelting iron with coal before Abraham Darby did at Colbrookdale. There's a very interesting book, The Natural History of Staffordshire by Dr. Plot, which many of you will have come across. There'll be copies, or at least a copy, in the, Black, in the in Erasmus Darwin house. And he, in a rather sort of eccentric way, but from our perspective, writes about geology and industry and mining and manufacturing, amongst other things, in a kind of potpourri of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of a book with a lot of details and a lot of um, insightful elements, but uh, not as, as we would see a history. The modern history of the black country, I would say, starts in the, at the end of the, the 18th century through the writings of two people who rarely make an appearance in the history of the, of the black country, but are very, very important. Uh, two people who have identical dates in terms of their years, both born in 1735, both dying in 1820, and this year is the 200th anniversary of their deaths. James Woodhouse, the poet, and James Keir, close friend of Erasmus Darwin, whom I've talked about at Erasmus Darwin House before, and uh, a manufacturer 
in the black country. Um, James Woodhouse is not terribly well known these days. Um, here's an image of, of him, not an official uh, portrait by any means. Uh, known as the poetical cobbler, one of the working class poets of the 18th century who were discovered by, by affluent individuals and uh, allowed to publish or enabled to publish. Um, James Woodhouse um, came from Rowley Regis, the uh, place where I live at the moment. So there's a particular interest and, and it's he, it, of, of mine farming background but he was apprenticed as a cobbler but he was appeared to be reasonably well educated and eventually through contact with um, uh, William Shenston at the Lessos, the, the, the poet and landscape gardener, he was sponsored and uh, began to write poems and made a reasonably comfortable living out of that. I don't want to quote in detail um, his his poems uh, today uh, um, that refer to the black country but there's a, a really interesting very very long uh, poem of his uh, given the rather strange title from our point of view um, um, uh, of, of the uh, the life and lubrications of Crispinus Scriblerus uh, which he published in the early part of the 19th century, which provides some wonderful descriptions of the black country. Uh, if you read it, you can see he talks about um, clay and coal and iron and industry. Um, and it's a sort of beautiful, beautifully clear and lucid description of of, of the black country and I would see him as the inventor of a way of looking at the black country poetically and romantically but based upon facts, based upon what you can see and observe, uh, things dug out of the ground, things that were made, things that were built. So there's, there's Woodhouse and the second individual is James Keir, whom you'll be much more familiar with, the chemist and the member of the Lunar Society. He had glassworks in Stourbridge area. He had a huge chemical factory in Tipton and coal mines in Tividale, and he lived in West Bromwich. Um, Keir wrote a wonderful contributor to Stebbing Shaw's history of Staffordshire right at the end of the 19th, end of the 18th century and his uh, essay on the mineralogy of South Staffordshire is I would see it as the first geological and topographical description of the black country published in 1798 and it's wonderful to set um, Keir's writing which is scientific and observational alongside Woodhouse's poetic description and combine the two in terms of creating a picture of the black country before the term black country was invented. However, what about the use of the term? Well, the term black country um, was used not to describe the black country first of all, but you can see it being used first of all to refer to Africa, a reference of course to the colour of the, the people who lived there uh, as a descriptive label. It was also used to refer to uh, a district of Belgium, the Noir Pay, in the Chalera region of Belgium um, and there are uh, paintings of the of the of, of, of this part of, of Belgium, which uh, look very much as if they're images of the black country, but they're not of not of our black country, but of a European black country. Um, so the Noir Pay was really an area which uh, 
was first of all given the label black country. But who was the first to use it? Well, again, there is debate here. Uh, it may well be that Princess Victoria was. Uh, in 1832, when she was 13 years of age, she recorded a visit to Birmingham and Wolverhampton in her scrapbook, where she says, the men, women, children, country and houses are all black but I cannot by any description give an idea of its strange and extraordinary appearance. The country is very desolate everywhere. There are coals about and the grass is quite blasted and black. I just now see an extraordinary building flaming with fire. The country continues black, engines flaming, coals in abundance everywhere, smoking and burning coal heaps intermingled with wretched huts and carts and little ragged children. Well, she uses the term uh, country and black in, with, with a small b and a small c. Um, so we've got to be very, very careful. Um, and it does seem as if it was in the 1840s that the term was actually specifically used, black country as a descriptive term for the area, particularly in a novel by the Reverend William Gresley, who was a, um, an, an Anglican priest in the Diocese of, 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 of Lichfield. And he wrote a book, Colton Green, A Tale of the Black Country, or a Region of Mines and Forges in Staffordshire. Very, very interesting book in terms of the description. And he talks about um, he talks about the black country being sort of negative as a dismal region. Um, but, but he seems to be the first person to have used it. Most famously is the writer Elihu Burrett, the American consul to Birmingham, whose book Walks in the Black Country and its Green Borderline uses the term um, black by night and red, um, sorry, black by day and red by night. The image that we commonly associate with the black country. But there's a lot more that he, that, that he says about it. There's a not lot more that Burrett, Burrett writes. And it is a very much an interesting book to dip into, even though his language is extremely flowery. In the 19th century, we can see the, the black country maturing in many ways. The coal industry becomes less important in the, at the end of the 19th century. Nail making becomes less important. Um, and heavy industry, chains, anchors, the uh, large brewing firms, glass making become much more important. The black country attracts artists and writers perhaps in a more positive way. And I mentioned J.M.W. Turner's image, um, although this does date from the 1830s. Turner did many watercolours of the black country. He seemed to be absolutely fascinated by the interplay of smoke, light, clouds, uh, how the water reflects of uh, both clouds and smoke and flame. And this one of several images, he seemed to return to the area quite frequently. Uh, this is a more descriptive image, uh, which shows the, the heavy industry, the large structures on top of the hill, a very much an imaginative history with the railway, uh, still the coal mining, chemical works, uh, pumping away a uh, producing image and this is a, a a very interesting picture in a guide in Griffith's Guide to the Iron Trade of Great Britain and then particularly poetically the writer the the, the printmaker the the engraver Richard S. Shattuck who produced a series of um, very atmospheric images of the black country, the black country 16 etchings, which again you can find online, which are largely pictures of a devastated landscape 
although he does present images of the um, of, 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 of industry that is continuing to function, the blast furnaces and so on. He's intrigued by, by what he can see. And I, I get the sense he's not writing a disparaging, not producing a, a disparaging set of images of the black country, but a set of poetic images of something that has gone and something, but something that is still very, very powerful. And then perhaps the most famous of the black country painters, Edwin Butler Bayliss, um, the affluent son of uh, uh, an iron uh, manufacturer in Wolverhampton, who produced a, a, a large number of images of the black country at the turn of the 19th and 20th century. This one is called Tipping the Slag, and it shows the uh, uh, an ironworks on the left hand side and the molten slag being tipped off the right hand side um, to uh, to the wasteland and um, they are also like Turner's and I think Shattuck's very poetic images. On a different note you can see the black country manufacturing artistic products um, at the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century. I mentioned Chance's Glass. Florence Cam um, uh, was a glassmaker. Her father used to work for Chance's Glass and then sent, set up the firm of Cam in Smethwick High Street. And she produced the absolutely stunning stained glass. And this is an example from the story of Dante and Beatrice. It is in Birmingham Museums, an, an art gallery at, at present, but many of the churches in Staffordshire, and indeed further afield, uh, contain stained glass produced by Florence Cam. And she won many international prizes. There are um, uh, th there are copies of her stained glass in Australia, North America, and in Europe. And then Ruskin pottery, one of the most important art potteries of the 19th century, again uh, produced in Smethwick. There's a case for talking about Smethwick as the artistic capital of, of the West Midlands in the early 19th century uh, with the production of glass, chances glass, um, Ruskin pottery um, and, 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 and cam glass. And there are others as well, but that's another story. The black country, therefore, I would suggest is immensely complicated and it became more complicated in the 20th and 21st century. Um, migration. Um, the black country has only really sort of existed as a result of migration. And although many people in black country see themselves as, a, as an identifiable social group, that social group has constantly been renewed by people from other parts of the United Kingdom, um, but also from abroad. Uh, Smethwick um, uh, developed, for example, in the 19th century, a large population of, of, of French and Belgians who were glassmakers, who, who came from from, from French and Belgian glass manufacturers. Um, there's a large migration of people from South Wales in the, in the 1930s to escape the sort of poverty of, of South Wales. And of course, more recently, from further afield, from, from the Indian subcontinent, from the West Indies and from Africa, all, of, all these migrants have added their, their rich diversity to the history of the region. The economy has been transformed as, as steel and, <coughs> excuse me, and, uh, and coal closed down, iron and steel and coal closed down in the, in, in the mid late 20th century. The economy, although we could say it, it, it didn't become as sort of rich as it had been, was stimulated by the presence of motorways by retail, by service industries, 
and also by the continuation of a large number of engineering concerns even a number of those a number of those went bankrupt and high tech engineering businesses education has been very important um, for a long time you could say the, the black country had a very low level of, of, of education you might say the black country boroughs do in, in terms of the qualifications that people have locally but in the last 40 50 years the university of wolverhampton and fe colleges have been extremely important in being a connection not only with cultural and educational development but also with industrial development the black country museum has been extremely significant as a center for for regional identity and uh for seven years i was a trustee of the black country museum and uh, it's a museum that despite the problems of covid has has opened up and is thriving in in in, in its ability to receive grants and and investment the arts um writers novelists such as archie hill and then you've got writers like Mira Siles, Satnam Sangira, Lenny Henry, uh, the comedian, Liz Berry, the poet, Rob Perry, the, the artist. The list could be extended. And there's humour, which I alluded to before, which has now become a kind of sort of industry in, in the black country. And that's, these connections have created a whole series of identities which have brought forward new ways of looking at the black country in the 20th century there is still though an immensely rich history which has barely been explored and um, one of the things that i'm intending to do um, i would hope is to write a sort of substantial history of the black country where i see the the black country and a hundred objects as a pointer towards that ladies and gentlemen i'm conscious of the time i'll leave it there and uh hopefully we can um uh deal with with questions um can you all hear me